So welcome everyone to the city of David. We are on the observatory to get a macro perspective of the site we're going to see today. Get to know a little bit about our surroundings. Uh, and we're going to start actually with something that's very easy to spot in the north. And that is the Al-Aqsa Mosque. A 1,300 year old structure built during the early Islamic period, shortly after the Golden Dome was built. And it's very important to remember that both of these structures, the Golden Dome we are so familiar with, and the gray one over here, are built on top of a much more ancient structure, a 2,000 year old structure. We could see right now the southern wall of that structure. Um, the southern wall of the Temple Mount. I'm just uh, gonna remind you that the Temple Mount that was built here 2,000 years ago by King Herod is the size of, I would say about 800 feet by 1,600 feet. And that means you could fit in there close to 30 football fields. It's huge. And what is the city of David? An area below the Temple Mount, okay? Stretching here all the way to the bottom of the site. This. This uh, national park is actually located between two valleys. And one valley you could see very clearly down here over the railing. Um, you could see the Kidron Valley, the famous biblical Kidron Valley. By the way, you're not seeing the bottom of the valley over here because we need to dig five floors lower to get to the bedrock. A second valley is hiding underneath a street many visitors come in from. Okay, this street runs parallel okay, runs parallel to the Kidron Valley. We have two parallel valleys. In between there is a mountain, the southern slopes of Mount Moriah. This is where the city of David is. And today the city of David is one of the only national parks in Israel that has a residential area in it. We could see over here houses. People are actually living here. Where is the ancient city hiding? Underneath these houses. How did the city look like 3,000 years ago? So I'd like you to imagine that we are standing somewhere on Mount of Olives, okay, on one of these peaks, and we're looking from there to where we're standing, okay? So we're standing there, we're looking here, okay? And what we see here 3,000 years ago, I'll show you a picture. Jerusalem at its infancy, in the beginning, okay? The way it might have looked like 3,000 years ago. We are standing on a rooftop somewhere up here right now. This is where we are. And what we're going to do in a moment is head down to see what's left of this big structure hiding underneath the visitor center, okay? Once we're down there, I will tell you who built it, what it was, who used it, okay? For now, I'm gonna keep you a little bit in suspense. Uh, we'll talk about it when we're there. The city of David is an archeological site situated in Jerusalem. It is considered to be one of the most important historical and biblical sites in the world. The area is believed to be the original city center of ancient Jerusalem and also holds a religious and historical significance for the Jewish people. Archaeological excavations at the city of David have unveiled numerous artifacts, structures and ancient remains shedding light on the city's rich history. Among the discoveries are ancient fortifications, water systems, tunnels, residential areas, palaces, administrative buildings and religious structures. If we would come here 60 years ago, we'd be standing in the state of Jordan. This was not Israel yet. 55 years ago, there was a war, a very famous war, the Six Day War, 1967. All this area around us becomes under Israeli sovereignty. For the first time in history, Israeli archaeologists could come and start digging here, and they do. One of the first ones who came here was Professor Yigal Shiloh. He came from the Hebrew University. On his expedition, he had a young, bright student in her early 20s doing a BA in archaeology. Her name, Eilat Mazal. She was a very enthusiastic student. She wanted to expand the dig. 
and a professor on a daily basis telling her, sorry, honey, we don't got enough uh, money. And eventually they wrap up shop and they leave. Fast forward to 2005, almost 20 years ago. The young student comes back here. When she comes back here, she's not a student, she's an archeologist herself. And she's walking way above us, okay? Over the deck, over the visitor center. And not because there were metal beams or any supports here. This entire around us, this entire area around us was filled with dirt. And she's walking here above our heads and she reaches a small office, a small wooden shack with a staff of maybe 10 people running the show back then. Today, I can tell you we have more than 200 guides. And one morning, 2005, a lock knock, knocks on the door. She goes in the office and she, everybody looks up at a lot and they say, a lot, what are you doing here? She tells them, guys, I have great news. She says, well, what's your news? So listen, I fundraised. I got all the permits. I could start digging again. They're like, wow, that's amazing news. So what do you need from us? And she uh, tells them, I need from you one small thing to move your office. So they knock down the wooden shock, they move it. And she digs, but then she wants to dig to where they moved it. So they have to move it again and again and again and again. And things become very dynamic. And everything around us has been dug in this area, okay, uh, by Elat Mazar. And I want to show you now what she found, okay? Because she digs from above us over here, she digs down till she reaches the bedrock, the bedrock of Mount Moriah, okay? Underneath us, the natural southern slopes of the mountain. And on the mountain, she found something super exciting. Take a look over here. Underneath our feet right now, I am pointing at a stone, okay? And from the stone beneath us, could even see through the metal grate over here, okay? You could count one, two, three, four big boulders going all the way to the black wooden wall. This is a four meter, 12 feet thick wall that starts here and goes more than 30 meters, more than 100 feet in that direction. This wall used to be very tall. What happened to it? It was knocked down, it was destroyed. What's left is the foundation. The interesting question is, when was this wall built? A lot dates this wall to 3,000 years ago. Wall number one. Wall number two is right over here. Look over the railing again. At the bottom, I am pointing at another stone. From the stone to the left, we see a five and a half meter thick wall. This wall also goes in that direction. We have not excavated the end of it. Together, these two walls create a corner, okay? We have two walls over here, perpendicular to one another, creating a corner of a public structure from 3,000 years ago. When Eilat found this, she writes in one of her early publications, maybe King David's palace, and her peers, the other archeologists respond, you're jumping to conclusions. Now, she continues on digging here. And before I show you a picture, of what she found here, let me ask you this. If she is right, and we're looking at what's left of King David's palace, does it make sense that the kings that would come after David, Solomon his son, Rechavam his grandson, Aviyah the great grandson, Asa, the entire Davidic dynasty, would they also use this facility? Or let me ask it a bit different. Even if they built new palaces for themselves, and even if they expand the city, are they gonna abandon a monumental, structure in a tactical location? No, they're gonna use it. And if we're digging here, many years after the city was destroyed by the Babylonians, what is more likely for us to find here? Things from the first resident or things from the last resident? Probably the last person who actually used the space. I wanna find something of his existence. And who was the last king of Judah before it was destroyed? His name was Zedekiah. In Hebrew pronounced Sidkiyahu. As you probably know, Kings don't live alone in the palace. Uh, people come to work there every day. Guards, slaves, uh, ministers, advisors. I'd like to share with you a very short story from the Bible. During the time of the last King Zedekiah, there's a prophet named Jeremiah. And in the Bible, it tells us about the prophet standing on the walls of the city, way below us, much closer to the valley. 
He is standing on the wall and he's shouting towards the palace that the city is going to be destroyed. The king's ministers hear this prophecy. They don't like what they hear. They demand from the king to take Mr. Fake News and throw him into a pit. Shut him up. He's demoralizing the people and the king's not strong. He says to his ministers, do whatever you want. The names of these four ministers are mentioned in the first verse in chapter 38. Here are the names. And then, Shephatiah the son of Matan, Gedaliah the son of Pashchur, Yehuchal the son of Shelamiah, and Pashchur the son of Malkiah, heard the words that Jeremiah had spoken to all the people saying. And why are these four ancient, uh, or why are these four ancient Hebrew names important to us? Because in 2007, underneath our feet, right over here in the corner, Elat Mazar found something that shook the foundation of the archaeological world. What I'm going to show you now on an academic level is like a nuclear bomb. Let's take a look. What we see over here are blown up seals. The original size is kind of this size. You can see in my, this is something that would close a letter. In ancient times, if you get a letter, okay, you know who sent you the letter because the sender takes their ring, stamps it on the clay seal, and now you could see the name. The letters over here, by the way, are Hebrew. And what it says over here is Gidaliahu, son of Pashchum, and when it says on this seal, Yehuchal, son of Shelamia. Two out of four names of ministers working for the last king, their seals were found underneath our feet right over here. Maybe their office. If this is their office, what is this structure? Could be the palace. Many people have trouble imagining the rubble around us as a palace. It's hard. Let me throw in one more curveball. You see the capital stone hanging on the wall? That is a replica. The originals are on display in the museum. Finding these stones here, okay, tells us that this structure wasn't only a public building, it was also a royal building, okay? This is Judean royalty from the first temple period. We find it in many other archeological digs, Judean royalty. By the way, this is the reason that the Bank of Israel took this style and put it on the back of a five shekel coin. So now you know what you see when you hold some money, okay? I hope that this short story highlights why the site we're in has become one of the top five most visited sites in Israel in the last few years. In 2019, we had over a million people coming through our various sites. Um, we're hoping this year, 2023, to break that record. Uh, can't be sure. Um, still post-pandemic, uh, but uh, who knows? Maybe we'll have good news soon. In front of us, opposite to the city of David, we could see one of many East Jerusalem neighborhoods. This specific one is called Siloan. It comes from the Greek word Siloam, which comes from the Hebrew word Shiloach. Shiloach is the name of the pool, the purification bath, a 2000 year old public mikveh that we could find at the bottom of the site. We will get there soon. The majority of the population today in Siloan are Muslim Arab. There are a few Jewish families living there, but not many. Looking at the view around us, it seems as if it's easy to walk up and down the mountains. There's a slope, there's a ramp, okay? But this is misleading because the view back in the day was different. It was much more rigid. It would look like a cliff, a platform, a cliff, a massive staircase. And we could actually see remnants of that. At the bottom of the houses in front of us, you could see the houses are built on the bare cliff, okay? And if the camera will zoom in, okay, you will see that in the cliff, there are these black square holes, okay? Like windows. If we would walk into one of those windows, do you know what we, what we would find ourselves in? Um, a chamber cut out in the bedrock, which was used as a tomb. The way they used to bury in ancient times was to take in someone who had passed away into one of those caves, lay them down on a stone bed that had a pillow, 
Not a comfortable pillow because it's made out of stone, but who cares? You're dead. And they would come out, close the cave, and come back after almost a year to find a skeleton. The skeleton was piled up and stuffed underneath the bed where all the bones of the person ancestors are. This was a family burial ground. And the reason we know that this is Jewish burial ground is text. Let me show you an example. Here is Hebrew text found in one of these caves. And what it says over here is this is the tomb of Yahu who is over the household. There is no gold or silver here. Cursed be the man who will open this. And what we learn from this text is, liar, liar, pans on fire. Because the custom back in the day was to bury yourself with some of your belongings. Many of these tombs were robbed in later times, so we don't find much. But some of these tombs um, did have treasures, um, whether it's jewelry, uh, weaponry, and other artifacts that some of them are on display in the museum today. We were up in the palace and we came down into the ancient neighborhood. Welcome to Uptown Jerusalem from the First Temple period. And what we're looking at right now is what's left of a First Temple period house. And many times people look at the rubble here and their general response is, hmm, house, I don't see a house here. Let me help you out. Over here on the picture, you could see two columns. These two columns are clearly visible right over there, okay? Two columns. A set of stairs leading up to the second floor we will see in a moment on the left. The people living over here are wealthy people. And how do we know that? Not only because they live close to the king, but also because of this side room. This side room was their own private bathroom. In ancient times, when people needed to go do their business, there is no sewage, there is no plumage in the city. You go down to the valley, through the gates, to a designated area, okay? I'll tell you more than that. Today, when we go into a bathroom, when we sit on a stall, we lock the door. If we see the handle going like this, we all share the same microsecond instinct of, don't come in. They didn't have that instinct in ancient times, okay? Because they would sit near each other in the bathroom. This family living over here in this house, they were spoiled, okay? They had their own private bathroom. Now I'm gonna show you the cool part. Come close to the railing, okay? Right over here, in the corner, on the floor, you'll notice there's a square stone with a round hole. Do you see it? Yes. Okay, yes. Okay, so again, in the corner, on the left, on the floor, square stone round hole. That is an ancient toilet from the first temple period. We haven't found many of these. And what we did with this toilet is take it to a lab, place it underneath a microscope. We took some swabs and we found Reza Du, pun intended, the last person who sat on this toilet 2,600 years ago is sending us a very warm regards. And we learned a lot about his diet. One thing, we found a lot of green leaves, local vegetation, things that grew here during the first temple period. Another thing that we found was raw meat. Okay, meat that has not been cooked. This is actually very weird because in ancient times you cook your meat. Eating raw meat on a daily basis, very dangerous. You could die very fast. In archaeology, we expect to find things that are common, not things that are rare. And finding over here something that's not common, we need to explain that. Here's what archaeologists are suggesting. What's happening in Jerusalem while the last person is sitting on the soil? Nobody's going to sit after him, okay? What's happening in the city during that time? It's being destroyed by the Babylonians. Someone might be hiding here. The little meat that they managed to salvage for themselves, they can't cook because if they start a fire, they'll be discovered by the Babylonians. The last thing I'd like to tell you over here is that when Eilat dug here as a student with her professor, Igal Shiloh, when they reached this first temple period layer, 
It was covered by dark ash, like a black carpet, which we find in many other archaeological digs in Jerusalem, the famous destruction layer of the first temple period. I don't know if you're going to use this, this is just a, an anecdote that the site is becoming more accessible uh, for different types of groups. Um, visually impaired groups can't see the archaeology, don't appreciate my visual. The only way they could connect is by opening these boxes and we let them touch. So the, the site is through over this process that we're installing more and more of these uh, 3D models. Yeah. So this is a picture of Eilat Mazar in the early 80s with her grandfather, Benjamin Mazar, who won the Israeli prize for life achievement. This is her professor. Igal Shilo. And all these archaeologists know how to give credit to those who came before them. The first one who came to Jerusalem, okay? Yeah, we can. The first one to come to Jerusalem was Captain Charles Warren. And we will tell his story once we're in the tunnel, okay? He came from England. So Jerusalem was a capital city, and that means other city paid their taxes. Not in the form of money, but in the form of goods. These jars were filled with honey, wheat, wine, oil, you name it. Now, on the jars, there were handles. And on the handles, there were symbols. By comparing other archaeological digs in Israel, we know which cities paid taxes because, because each city had their own unique symbol. These over here are statues. Idols that we found. You know, the prophets in the Bible would be unemployed if this phenomenon did not happen during the first temple period, okay? Uh, people did not only worship the one God, they also worshiped idols. The original size of these statues is about a third. We're talking about pocket size, okay? These statues were objects people could keep in their pockets. And when they were afraid or anxious, they could put their hand in and feel and rub it and pray to it. I could easily imagine someone leaving their house during the first temple period, taking a few steps and doing this. Oh, guess what? 3,000 years have passed and um, nothing really changed, okay? Also, we found over here the first like. We are now getting closer to the entrance to the most ancient thing we're going to see on this tour. A tunnel that was dug in the mountain almost 4,000 years ago by the Canaanites who lived here before the Jebusites, who lived here before King David conquered the city. This tunnel is going to lead us down to the water, to the spring. As we go down, imagine that this is the path that people took every single day, up and down. They went down with their empty jars, clay jars, collected the water, and climbed all the way up. Let's, let's see the tunnel. We are going down in a 4,000 year old tunnel, and eventually, at the bottom, we will reach the water. Let's go. Hold the railing, walk slowly.
All right, to understand the tunnel we just walked in through, we're going back in time 150 years. The people in control of the Middle East back then are the Turks, the Ottoman Empire, and they're in financial crisis. They are about to collapse. England, the superpower back then, knows this. And they're thinking to themselves, hmm, in geopolitics, there is no such a thing as an empty space, as a void. If someone leaves, someone comes in. So the British say, here's an idea. Let's send spies now to the Middle East to map the land, cartographers. That way, our soldiers, when they need to take over the land, they'll have the most updated maps. Do they tell the Turks they're sending spies? Of course not. So what is their cover story? Archaeologists. Hundreds of teams swarm the Middle East. The joke is that if you want to visit today, Egypt, Jordan, Israel, Lebanon, Syria, all in the same place at the same time, go to the British Museum. Got a lot of stuff there. And who came to Jerusalem 150 years ago in 1867? Captain Charles Warren. Warren was an archeologist and he was digging outside in the valley, mapping, surveying. One day he finds an entrance to a tunnel. So he walks in, walks for a few minutes and finds himself at a dead end. He looks to the left, he looks to the right. There's a wall, a wall, looks straight. Then he looks up and he sees this pit. He decides to climb it up. We're looking down. Charles Warren came from the bottom up. When he reached this spot, he continued on going up the tunnel, but he didn't have a modern staircase. When Charles Warren reached the top, he continued on climbing the tunnel. We just came down through, but he did not have a staircase. I'll tell you more than that. Most of the tunnel here was covered in dirt, and that means he had to crawl. When he reached the top and he came out, he finds himself in, a, in an agricultural field, maybe a potato field, okay? And he looks up and he sees the sky and in the distance above him, he sees the walls of the old city. And he realizes something people didn't realize until his time. People were living under the impression that the ancient biblical city of kings and prophets was hiding somewhere underneath the old city. And while they're not necessarily wrong, it's not where the city started. This is where the city started, where the water systems are. Charles Warren was a biblical scholar. He remembered the famous story of how King David captured the city by his, his soldiers. King David's soldiers found the secret passageway leading from the spring into the city. This is the only tunnel we found that fits that description, meaning we are standing now where Jerusalem began, where everything started, okay? Outside the walls of the old city. Probably some of you are familiar with the myth of Atlantis, a city sinking in the water. Well, Jerusalem, something pretty similar happened here, but instead of sinking in the water, it sank in dirt. Or should I say it was covered by dirt because Jerusalem is not one city. It's a city on top of a city on top of a city. Every culture that came here built on top of the former. This city has been conquered more than 40 times, more than any other city in the world, okay? And the deeper we dig, the farther back in time we go. So let's go and see the water. We are exiting the tunnel and down into the pool, the ancient pool where they collected the water from. Today, there is no water in the pool. It is dry. Why is it dry today? I will tell you in a moment. So, we're looking down into a pool that today has no water. And at the bottom, you could see a tunnel. A tunnel that the water would run through. In, out. A few months ago, um, archaeologist Eli Shukran and Professor Gershon Galili 
uh, published that they found Hebrew writings on the wall, okay? Uh, something that's never been seen before. They claimed, to the best of my knowledge, that they used some special technology to see the writing on the wall. And as it is today, the academic community is still skeptical. There's more research need to be done to, to validate whether there is actual writing or are we filling in some gaps? Are we seeing what we want to see? This is a big question. And I urge you as viewers to follow this story in the media, um, through the headlines. Uh, things are still not clear, but uh, once more research will be done, I think we'll be more confident in saying, is there more Hebrew writing on the wall dating back to the time of King Hezekiah when the wet tunnel was dug? Or is it just wishful thinking? We don't know yet. So stay in touch. Smash the like button. <laughs> if you look up straight ahead above us, you will notice there are two walls, okay? And in between the two walls, there's a gap. There's a, even a wooden staircase between. You see it? Okay, press the button now. Another thing is, the blue lights was the pool you just came out from. You went in the pool, you came out of the pool, right over there. The last thing is these big boulders. You see these huge stones underneath our feet? All of these come together to one big complex. Here's the good news. You don't have to imagine how it looked like in ancient times. Just look at the screen that's coming down from the ceiling now and we're gonna bring the archeology span back to life. Take a look, I'll explain. So we're looking into a fortress that was built over the spring to protect it because the most important resource is water. water. No water, no life. If you look at the left side of the screen, You'll notice big stones, the left side of the screen, and those stones are the ones underneath us. And that means in a moment, you are all going to go through that doorway on the right in the bottom into the fortress itself, okay? You're gonna be inside. Some of you are even walking through the water. How does this fortress connect to the city above us? We're zooming out, take a look. You could see the spring underneath the fortress. Originally, the water was channeled into the pool. It's dry. Why is it dry? Well, you're gonna tell them soon. Okay. <laughs> Above the fortress, there's a soldier standing on the right side. He's on guard duty right now, okay? Behind the fortress, you could see the two walls I showed you a moment ago. Remember the two walls and the space in the, between? That was a safe passageway for soldiers to come down from the main city to the fortress, okay? That, now, look up at where I'm pointing. Did everybody see where I'm pointing? Look at that wall over there. Look up. We're getting a taste of what the pilgrimage looked like during the holidays in the first temple period. Hundreds of thousands of people would make their way from all over the country to the city. If you look over here on the other side, you could see people are on their way to the temple and we are going to do something similar. The good news is we don't have to walk up. We're going to hitchhike a ride on a drone. You're standing on the drone right now. So I hope you understand it's not a real drone. It's a virtual drone. Yeah, uh, if anybody expected actual flying, not happening. If you look at the main screen, we're gonna fly to the bottom of the city and slowly climb up. Take a look. We're starting at the bottom. Eventually, we will reach the top. You will see the first temple that was built by King Solomon. King David's palace. The first temple.
Enjoy the rest of your tour, everyone.